Welcome to The Economy Magazine. I'm Benjamin Chong Alfares with an overview of the latest highlights in the world of economics and finance. In today's magazine, we explore the effects of the economic sanctions on Iran. And we start a new segment on girl power in the economy. First, the headlines. We begin in Israel, where Teva, the largest gener generic drug manufacturer in the world, announced it will fire 5,000 employees. As part of its worldwide restructuring program, Teva is shedding 10% of its workforce by the end of 2014. The drug giant expects to save $2 billion by the end of 2017. Earlier this week, Teva said it would expand its manufacturing facilities in Jerusalem, adding hundreds of new jobs. In the U.S., there might finally be some progress in the partisan standoff that led to the federal shutdown. Conservative Republicans are largely in favor of extending the nation's borrowing limit for four to six weeks. But solving the immediate stalemate over the debt ceiling won't necessarily resolve the spending fight that closed the government. Many of the same conservatives who backed a short-term increase of the debt ceiling are willing to keep government shut in order to fight over the health law. Basically, what we've been saying is the speaker and my Republican friends should take yes for an answer. We're ready to go to conference. We have simple, simple requests. Open the government. Let us pay our bills. We'll no negotiate on anything you want to negotiate on. The International Monetary Fund warned that a one percentage point increase in long-term borrowing rates in the U.S. could lead to a loss of $2.3 trillion in bond markets. The IMF expects monetary tightening to ensue when the Federal Reserve starts tapering the stimulus plan or if the government fails to raise the debt ceiling. The fund is concerned that the world's financial system remains vulnerable as stimulus and support in the wake of the crisis are scaled back. It also cautioned that a failure to raise the U.S. debt ceiling could seriously damage the global economy and financial system. In Brazil, the central bank raised the country's benchmark lending rate for a fifth straight time, the longest stretch of increases in the world. The bank's board raised the main interest rate to 9.5% from 9%, saying the increase would ensure slower inflation next year. Inflation for 2013 is forecast at 5.86% and more than 6% for 2014, well over the 4.5% target. But the rate hike has weighed on economic growth and it's politically perilous for Brazil's leadership which promised to lower borrowing costs. And Bangladesh falls victim to another factory blaze as leading Western brands and the government have failed to improve safety standards. Despite 90 leading, mostly European brands signing a new safety agreement drafted by trade unions, safety standards have yet to be improved. Major U.S. retailers, including Walmart, refused to sign the safety agreement. Bangladesh boasts the world's second biggest clothing industry worth $21.5 billion a year and 80% of its exports. We're joined now by Karen Kirsch, I-24 News producer, for a new segment of our show focused on women in the economy. Ms. Kirsch. Hi, Benjamin. How are Hi, you? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. And I'm here, you know, to talk about feminomics, what okay. we call, but uh, we're starting off with uh, Janet Yellen the recent uh, selection of Barack Obama yeah. to head the Fed. Um, and she's quite possibly about to become the most powerful woman in the world. Indeed. And she's definitely going to be the most powerful woman in the U.S. and, and the most, um, the strongest policymaker, economic policymaker in history, which is, um, uh, it seems very dramatic and, and it kind of is. Actually, of all the stuff that I've read about it in the past, um, I'd say a couple of days. I would say I'm hoping for the day where her gender is not an issue. Right, right. But obviously it still is. But it still, but yeah, it still, it still is. is. And still sort of her, her uh, career track and what got her to be where she is and, and the sort of uh, criticism about her selection. And w even when she was still a nominee, doesn't necessarily focus only on policy, but also on kind of personality characteristics. Uh -huh. Is she assertive uh -huh. enough? Will she handle Congress uh -huh. well? All right. kinds of things that are not necessarily there when uh, when a man is is the right. candidate. They focus on different things. And sure. uh, yesterday, in the profile that the New York Times published about her, um, it was something that I didn't know and actually made was very interesting. Mm -hmm. N I'll never read something like this about a man being nominated for head of the federal bank. It was a story about how when she when she had her boy in the early 80s, she has one boy. Uh, she and her husband, who's also an economic Nobel laureate, um, decided to pay, uh, overpay their babysitters. Oh, the grief. 
Um, <laughs> and they actually, they actually based a model for stimulus of uh, employment based on this experience they've had with their own babysitters that she took, took on and they build, a, uh, they build a theory, a practical theory on it, which she's now use, she's maybe going to use in the Fed. Uh, one of her major interests is uh, unemployment and how you can stimulate employment. Mm -hmm. And what she learned from this experience was that sometimes when you're paying more, you're boosting morale, right. um, which, which doesn't sound like uh, something that, that would help the economy, but it increases productivity. Right, absolutely. And in times of, and in times of unemployment, uh, you would like as, as a business, as a country, as whatever, to increase your productivity you know, of your current workers right. and not necessarily right. to think. And she's one of the major supporters of, of, of stimulus still right. in the... Right. Right. Well, obviously, by pumping more money into the economy, also people have more money to spend, which ultimately helps the economy. Yeah. So, um, and when you look at the numbers, there are more and more women studying economics, but they're not progressing as right. much, and they're not in the faculties, right. and they're not pursuing PhDs, which is a problem in, in academies at all, in general. Mm -hmm. And in one of the studies that I've read that was published now, um, they examined the top 10 uh, faculties in the, in the Ivy Leagues in the yeah. US of economics and to see uh, where, where are women situated. And since the 1980s, uh, the number of women is growing constantly, but it's still 10 than, less than 10%. Right. So, so when it's less than 10% of the economic in, in the lower uh, MAs and PhDs, then of course they're not going to get to the Fed. Right, right, right. So that's something that uh, <laughs> we have a long way to go, I guess. Thank you so very much, Karen Kirsch. With that, uh, we will be having this segment uh, several times a month. Thank you very much. It's very Thank interesting. You. The sanctions that have cut Iran off from the global banking system have greatly hurt its economy, making the Iranian leadership more conciliatory. As Iran's economy bleeds, some believe its leadership is buying time to complete its nuclear ambitions before giving in to the world's demands. More in the following report. Mr. President. On September 24th, Hassan Rouhani, the new Iranian president, gave his speech to the UN. Some countries' representatives welcomed his words, seeing his diplomacy as the result of the Western policy of economic sanctions. Israel will know Others, like Israel, that say that the Iranian president's many, moderation is only an illusion. Others. A few days later in Tehran, Hassan Rouhani again seemed to have a different tone. We said from the beginning that we are not looking for win-lose games. We are looking for a win-win game. We can win together. When the sanctions are removed, both sides will win. When mutual confidence is built, the two sides will win. One reason for Rouhani to reach out may be that the Iranian economy deteriorated sharply over the last two years. Due to sanctions, Iranian oil exports have been halved since 2011, an estimated $40 billion net loss. Since 2010, local currency has lost 24 percent of its value against the dollar. The situation has left the Iranian population in economic dire straits. Damage uh, is, of course, inflation make life for people in Iran very difficult, particularly to middle class and lower middle class and the poor. Now, the poor get sub subsidies, but the middle class and the, and the young, they have a problem. The, there is a, a, um, unemployment, widespread unemployment, very difficult. Uh, there is no investment inside uh, the economy. Uh, the investment inside the economy, uh, I just read it today, plummeted 20 percent as compared to, to last year, investment in industry, in, in things like that. The sanctions against Iran include several areas. On the banking front, funds in rials, the Iranian currency, are frozen abroad, and its use is prevented in transactions with the rest of the world, except some countries such as Turkey, India, and China. China also steers clear of oil sanctions on Iran. They buy oil at a lower price from Iran, below $90 a barrel, while Brent crude, for example, often exceeds $110. This is an important industry as 55 percent of Iranian losses to GDP are based on the export of oil. The internal economic system is another contributing factor to Iran's economic ills. We have also to remember that the sanctions are not the only problem that Iran is facing. If you look at the uh, 
at the index of uh, free economy. Iran is a number, I think, 168 the last time I checked. So this means that uh, it's almost the last in the world. There are maybe one or two, North Korea, one or two countries behind it. All the economy is controlled by governments, uh, agents, and uh, like revolutionary guards, all kinds of boniads, the foundations, and so on. This means that the economy cannot uh, develop. Reform from within may help foreign companies that are eagerly awaiting an easing of sanctions in order to resume business in the 76 million person strong Iranian market. According to Israeli news source Ynet, U.S. oil firms are planning a meeting with Iranian oil minister Bijan Zanganeh. The meeting is unconfirmed but not being denied. Companies such as Renault, which had to interrupt business as usual in July due to tightening of U.S. sanctions, now await a green light to resume. But how open can trade get? It is true that this is what Khamenei wants. He wants to keep all the power, he wants to have the bombs, and he wants the economy a, a little bit open, but not really open. So the, the Iranian game will be uh, to improve gradually. Also, the people who want reform, they are afraid of moving too fast because everything also can collapse, like it happened in Gorbachev. They are afraid of Gorbachev uh, syndrome, and particularly how many are afraid of Gorbachev syndrome. Interestingly, the government shutdown in the U.S. may allow Iran some economic breathing room as American focus turns inward. This may mean that more Iranians are able to find work in the coming months. The Iranian-American rapprochement has had an economic impact already, stabilizing the real against the dollar. Joining us in the studio now is Dr. Meir Litvak, director of the Alliance Center for Iranian Studies. Dr. Litvak, thank you very much for joining us. So, I mean, obviously, the sanctions have had an impact on the Iranian economy, on the Iranian people. Um, to how long will the Iranian government be able to, to hold off on making any uh, uh, compromise? Well, predictions are impossible to make, but the Iranian government cannot ignore the plight of the Iranian people. We have to remember that Rouhani's main slogan in his election campaign was that I will improve Iran's international standing and I will improve the economy. He had a powerful statement that it's wonderful that centrifuges are turning around, but people also have to eat. Mm -hmm. The fact that he got 50 more than 50 percent of the vote shows that the Iranian people sent an, a very clear message to the government, we do not support the idea of a jihad economy, of austerity measures. We want Im economic improvement. We want an opening to the world. In the Middle East, after the past two years, governments cannot ignore what the people are saying. Why isn't Rouhani doing more? I mean, it seems like he's taking his time. He's biding his time to, to, you know, to get to an agreement with the West. Well, he doesn't control Iran foreign policy completely. He needs to get the, the approval for whatever he does from the supreme leader. The supreme leader is much more cautious about any kind of rapprochement with the U.S. The Supreme Leader wants an agreement on the nuclear issue without Iran ma uh, making two uh, they put politics uh, before economics, yes, basically. Yes, yes. and it doesn't. Uh, Supreme Leader does not want to give too much on the on the nuclear issue. And here, there's a give and take. Uh, How long does the Iranian leadership have before the crisis becomes unbearable to the people and there might be an explosion? Again, such you never know. An, uh, it's, it's like a, a volcano that you never know when it when it will erupt. Yes, but uh, the economic situation in Iran is, ex is very bad. People are suffering. Again, people sent a message to the regime. The regime understands it. And mm -hmm. when the regimes look around Iran, they, can, they understand they cannot afford, uh, uh, let's say, uh, unre popular unrest in, uh, in similar to Arab, to, to Arab countries. So they have to do something about it. Now, what they're trying to do is maneuver. Is that they try an opening with the West without making uh, uh, concessions that would jeopardize their nuclear ambitions. How damaging is it to the world's efforts um, to pressure Iran that, you know, China and Russia continue to, to make deals with them? Well, obviously, it, uh, Chinese and Russian policy harms the sanctions and harms the world efforts. Uh, China is one of Iran's major oil uh, um, buyers. Uh, China sells a lot to uh, its products the to stores Iran. are full of Chinese yes, products. Yes, yes, which also undermine uh, Iranian factories who cannot compete with very cheap Chinese uh, products and many factories were shut down or workers, by the way, don't get their salaries. So ironically, actually, the fact that the Chinese are giving them all this business is not helping them. It helps maybe the Iran at the state, does not help the Iranian people right. or ordinary Iranians. It's certainly not, not Which helpful. ultimately also goes against Iranian people. Yes. But um, frankly, the, uh, considering that the, the previous um, 
uh, revolt by the Iranian people was, was shut down so aggressively, um, can we, would we see another revolt? Again, there's no way of knowing. But you can say that if one situation gets so bad that people have nothing to lose, then they become dangerous. Uh, the Iranian regime is very careful not to push the people to such an, uh, the corner in which they will have nothing to lose, and then they make a revolt against the regime. And what the Iran government, it is a dictatorship, it's a vicious dictatorship, but also it's a dictatorship which very often is attuned to what the people are saying, and this is why they took this line of now trying to reach an agreement with the West on okay. the nuclear issue. Thank you very much, Dr. Leidvak. This takes us to the end of this edition. Thank you very much for watching. Please send us your comments. Join us on Facebook and Twitter. We'll see you again tomorrow.